Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, June 13th, 2010. I'm Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Jeff D. Hi, Hi. Matt. How you been? Good. You? I've been pretty good. We are a live public access television program sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. The ACA is a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. For more information about the ACA, you can visit the website www.atheist-community.org. There you can find our frequently asked questions page about who are we, what do we believe, what don't we believe, why don't we believe it, etc. Um, you can also find information about our various events including the Atheist Happy Hour, which is every Thursday at the Dog and Duck Pub beginning at around 7 o'clock, and I'm doing these announcements in just whatever order I feel like. So they'll scramble for the right screens. Um, and the ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday at Romeo's on Burton Springs Road beginning at around 11 o'clock, or 11.30 actually, see, 11.30. Uh, except for the first Sunday of the month, when we host a lecture series at the Austin History Center located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. Um, I, next month's lecture is, is it Amy Parsons next month? Yes. Yeah, Amy Parsons from um, Camp Quest, Texas, uh -huh. uh, will be down to, to talk to us then. Um, any atheist or atheist friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events. You don't have to be a member to attend. Um, and after this program is over, we get together for dinner at, Ro at uh, Threadgills at 301 West Riverside Drive. See, I can say it before they can even get it up on the screen. We're on the air till about 6 o'clock. We'll be down at dinner around 6.30 or so. That is also open to the public, unless you're coming down to preach, proselytize, or provoke, in which case, please piss off. Uh, I'm kidding. Just don't come down and cause trouble. Anybody else who wants to come down and actually have a decent conversation or have some dinner, uh, you're all welcome to do that. There's no membership requirements for that either. There's upcoming events in addition to uh, our regularly scheduled events, and I need to start pushing it more. And one is our yearly bat cruise. For those who don't know, Austin, Texas has the largest metropolitan bat population, I think, on the planet, if, if not at least in the country. And every September we get together, we rent a boat down at the lake and go out, take some food, snacks, drinks, whatever, have a good time, um, and then watch the bats come out at night. This year, um, we're planning on starting it off with uh, an afternoon lecture, um, which we're still finalizing the, deal, the details for. Um, although right now, the plan is for me to uh, update and amplify my superiority of secular morality lecture, um, which we'll use as kind of the kickoff to the Bat Cruise event. And also, after the Bat Cruise is over, uh, there are a number of us every year who get together and go to the 10 o'clock show uh, at Esther's Follies on 6th Street. That's not being organized by the ACA. It's just too much hassle to try and figure out who wants to go and who doesn't and get tickets and should we, you know, try to book the whole venue, et cetera. So um, as we're, I'll give it more reminders as we get closer to it. But for the people who want to go to this musical comedy magic uh, extravaganza, I guess, you can go online. We'll have a link on our website to the Esther's Follies website, and you can uh, look into possibly getting your tickets and joining us there afterwards. In addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. You can go to nonprofitsradio.com for more information about the show. That's P-H-E-T-S. Um, it's currently on hiatus until probably early to mid-August. Um, there's a lot going on, schedule conflicts. I'm getting ready to move, which means Delahunty International Studios will move. And then as soon as we're set back up, we'll, we'll get back to regular shows with the nonprofits as well. That is all of the announcements that I have. That was awesome. You have done this before, haven't you? Once or twice. <laughs> I wouldn't say that was awesome, though. It was awesome. Cool. I, you didn't have to. I said it was awesome. Awesome. Jeff thinks it was awesome. 
It's hey, a live call-in show. Yeah. Which I didn't mention that if you don't get through on the telephone today, see, this is how unawesome you it made was. a mistake. <laughs> if you don't get through on the telephone today, or you don't want to, you can email tv at atheist-community.org. That goes to myself, the co-host, some of the people behind the scenes. Obviously, we get so much email, we cannot possibly answer all of it, but we do our best to answer a good chunk of it. Um, they'll have the number up for you, like almost right away, and uh, you can call in and have a discussion. Tell us what you believe, why you believe it, or whatever strikes your fancy, but I'm turning it over to Jeff. You are? I am. You are All right. on, well, I, sir. I have, I have just a small <coughs> thing to talk about. Um, Islam has gotten, um, it's gotten beat up a little bit in recent weeks. Yeah. There are a number of, 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 of events that uh, uh, they didn't care for too much. Um, starting with uh, boob quake. And this actually made the the cable news. Um, a Muslim cleric, uh, oh, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name, Sadigi was his last name, uh, quoted as saying uh, by the Iran Iranian medium, media, quote, many women who do not dress modestly lead young men astray, corrupt their chastity, and spread adultery in society, which consequently increases earthquakes. And uh, being the rational, uh, science-minded folk that we are, uh, one of, one of uh, us uh, unbelievers decided to put that to the test. And she organized on Facebook this event called Boobquake, um, uh, which simply consisted of, uh, on a particular day, young ladies were encouraged to dress immodestly, which does not mean nakedness, but... Um, you know, a little, a little cleavage. It, it varied. Immodest, varied. immodest from this, this yeah. uh, Muslim's view is anything short of a burqa. So correct. Yeah. Um, in, in order to see if uh, if giant earthquakes could be caused, and the answer was no. Uh, so that that was amusing. Um, I couldn't participate in that one myself personally, but I did jump on board the next. Uh, um, um, event targeting Islam, which was uh, Everybody Draw Muhammad Day. As, we're all, as we all know, uh, the uh, some, is it some? Is it all? I don't it know. It is some. Some Muslims have an issue with, uh, with, uh, with depictions of their prophet Muhammad. And uh, some of them take this so far as to kill cartoonists and attack, attempt to kill other cartoonists who um, have produced such images. And, uh, and somebody had the brilliant idea of, you know, there's only so many of us that can kill at once. So everybody draw Muhammad Day was on a particular day. Uh, members of this Facebook group were encouraged to, uh, to generate their own uh, drawn images of the Prophet Muhammad. And, and here's mine. This was posted on Facebook. Yeah, I, I didn't warn the guys in the, in the control room, but there he is. This is actually inspired by actual medieval uh, paintings of Muhammad as he is depicted in those paintings. I quite enjoyed uh, drawing the turban. That was a, an, an interesting uh, arrangement of lines. Uh, the fire on his head is not me uh, trying to make some kind of statement. That's Apparently, uh, in medieval Islam imagery from some cultures, that's sort of analogous to a, a halo. Yeah, kind of a holy see. fire. Yeah, it's, a, it's right. It's an indication of his, of his holiness. Uh, and bare feet. Again, that not, not making any kind of like, you know, Beatles message or anything, but um, simply that's the way he's depicted. And if you're curious, if you're you know, surprised that I'm saying that's the way he was depicted, that's because... You know, this idea that you shouldn't draw Muhammad is, uh, does not date back to the founding of the religion. In fact, um, there's a lot of historical images of Muhammad. Now, some of them have been later defaced, so you just see this sort of white blob of, the, of whatever the substance was that the painting was made on, so, sometimes surrounded by the halo of fire. But a lot of other instances are... are detailed drawings of there's the guy in his robe with his turban and his 
and his flamey head and the whole nine yards. Uh, if you're curious, you can see a collection of such images at tinyurl.com slash dnd73. Uh, there's, there's a whole collection. So that stands for do not draw? It, it was random. <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the Mohammed image archive at zombietime.com. But again, that tiny URL is uh, tinyurl.com slash dnd73. So, now, uh, as you can see, my Mohammed was just a you know, attempting to recreate the historical depiction of the guy from, uh, uh, as he was shown in the past. Um, I, I Which didn't, is what I did. didn't go out of my way to, you know, show him with an arrow through his head or, you know, somebody doing this behind him or, you know, that, I'm not making any fun of him, uh, though a lot of people did take it that way because a lot of people are really upset about this. And I think... Um, I completely understand that. The only reason I didn't go that far is I didn't think it was necessary. Because the reason people are upset is not that, um, it's not just that uh, there have been people killed over this. Because you can, you can argue that that's extremists that are taking it that far. But the very idea that any, uh, that any group can have an internal rule about what is proper and then externalize and say, we are offended if anybody else not in our group breaks that rule is just not appropriate. And, and so, you know, I, I only wanted to take it as far as let's, let's do an image. You can't possibly complain that this is disrespectful um, and see what happens. Well, I... I saw what happened. The most interesting result was uh, after Everybody Draw Muhammad Day, I got onto another group called Everybody Draw Muhammad Again Day. And, uh, and by the way, Everybody Draw Muhammad Month is still ongoing. These are all Facebook groups. And, uh, and there was a fellow who um, uh, is a Muslim and, and joined Everybody Draw Muhammad Again Day and was uh, basically saying to his fellow uh, Muslims, you know, let's not take this too seriously. These, uh, these unbelievers are just trying to get our goat. Not true. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we, they, they have the right to, uh, to do what they want, but, you know, um, uh, Allah will deal with them after they're dead. And, um, and that's where I got into a discussion with them. I'm saying, what, what do you mean when you say we have a right to draw whatever we want, but Allah will, you know, pass judgment on us afterward. Isn't a right something that you don't get judgment passed on you afterwards? It isn't, isn't punishing somebody for exercising their rights uh, fundamentally wrong? Um, that went back and forth several times until he finally stopped uh, responding to me. Uh, and that, that's the problem. It's, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't have to go as far as killing people. The fundamental problem here is this idea that, that not only do, do uh, rules of behavior come from a god, but that they come from this particular group's god. And since the group believes that, they believe they're in a position to tell all the rest of us what we may or may not do. We're talking about drawing pictures here, you know. Um, you, you could change this to anything. You could say, you know, uh, with, with my new religion, we're offended by people who wear straw hats. So you mustn't be wearing straw hats. Well, I, 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 I can't make up a group. I can make up a group and say, we're not going to wear any straw hats. That's perfectly okay. People want to join my group voluntarily and not wear the straw hat. No problem. But as soon as, you, as, uh, as my group turns around and says, nobody else may either, or you offend us, and, oh, you're wearing that straw hat. You must be doing it to anger me. Um, that's, that's over the line. And, um, and, and some go beyond that. It's not just a matter that you've offended us. You've offended us to the point where we will then and, and enact and revenge and upon And we're going to kill you. Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. But it, it, for me, I mean, it's not, this is, um, 
you don't even have to take it that far. Right. It doesn't have it has doesn't have to be taken that far before it's an issue, right? Um, so uh, so there we go. That was everybody draw Muhammad Day, yeah. and it, there's it's ongoing. There's there are waves of Muhammad drawings coming out, and um, it's interesting to see that. Um, that Islam can do pretty much nothing about it. And it's, you know, the, uh, it has been said that one of the reasons that Islam is, uh, has been so problematic uh, uh, lately is that it never underwent a reformation and never, you know, ha was forced to uh, kind of rein itself back in and get a little more civilized. And uh, I am of the opinion that that's, that's the goal of these kinds of things, of boob quake and, and uh, everybody draw Muhammad Day, is to simply um, forcefully remind, though not violently, forcefully remind Muslims that they don't have any special rights. And, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I'll, I will refrain from doing anything that would obviously, uh, uh, that obviously uh, insult anybody. But you make up special rules for your religion, those are rules for your religion. They're not rules for me. You can't expect me to live by them. You remember the, um, the cracker? Mm-hmm. Right, the, uh, the communion wafer incident? Yes. Uh, same thing. That's the Catholic Church, same thing. Yep. Catholic Church says the communion wafer is a special little object that has to be treated a certain way. Um, but if you're a non-believer, to expect a non-believer to have to treat it that way is, uh, is just wrong. Just wrong. Which is why I ate them with queso. Did you? See, I didn't participate in I didn't know really where to find one and wasn't willing to go to the trouble. But Well, I had a little a minor go-around um, at the blog for the Austin American Statesman Religion Reporter on the subject. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, and, and she had basically written off this Draw Muhammad Day as some kind of childish action by bigots that were out to uh, vilify and demean Muslims. And I pointed out that uh, it was uh, abominable to hear that from a reporter, that they couldn't see the free speech element of this, um, that this wasn't just, ah, we're going to stick it to Muslims day. Um, it was a legitimate uh, action. And that in this particular scenario, it was because Muslims had already demeaned themselves and turned themselves into Muslims. Some Muslims, anyway, not all of them, but they had rea overreacted. And that if there was any similar overreaction by any other religion to any other, anything else that was comparable to this, a similar thing would take place. Um, you know, we've got our little buddy Christ. I wish we had a buddy, uh, a, a buddy, buddy Muhammad, to go with him. You could just say it's a buddy Muhammad. Who would know? Everybody who's seen Dogma. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but apart from that, uh, we got Muhammad, our sacred cow, uh -huh. and, and FSM watching over all of them. So, anyway, we're going to, you want to go ahead and start taking calls? I'm ready for calls. Sure. Okay, so we'll, we've got one call at least waiting. Um, I know there's others that are getting ready to queue up. The number's on the screen. As a reminder, if you don't get through today or you don't want to, you can email tv at atheist-community.org and we'll do what we can to get you an answer. But we've got, is it Stefan? Yes, it is, yes. From New York, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, how are you doing? <coughs> Not bad. <clears throat> okay, um, well, as I uh, pointed out, I'm a theist, and, you know, the argument has been presented that Christians have no proof for their position, and, they're, and the atheist, he has um, evolution and the evidence to present it. And my question is, have we as human beings witnessed our own birth? And the question is that we really and truly um, accept that the person who is our mother, we accepted by faith, really and truly, because, you know, you really didn't see it unless, of course, it was videotaped. You know, it's not until later someone who's probably adopted is then told later that, this person is, was not your birth mother. So I'm saying that generally, even with the Big Bang, no one realistically saw it. So it can be done from a standpoint of faith, from faith because it is really something that, you're, that you believe in without having to see. And it's the same thing for, for theists as well. Okay, there's about six things that are kind of wrong that I, that I want to address. And 
I'll, I'll trade off, and I'm sure Jeff spotted all six of them as well. The first thing is that atheism and evolution are in, are in no way tied together. Uh, my, my atheism is not dependent on an acceptance of evolution or anything else. It is entirely dependent on the theistic claims have not met their burden of proof. So that's number one. The other is that the, your, your example of, of having to take it on faith that your mother is your mother um, is not true. I mean, first of all, we can do DNA testing to verify that my mother is my mother. Um, and that, that also applies to questions about Big Bang origins. The Big Bang cosmology is a scientific theory that made testable predictions. And then we went out and verified those predictions by observing the cosmic microwave background radiation, etc. This wasn't just a hunch that we're accepting on faith. It is the best explanation that is supported by evidence. Okay, furthermore, there is a scientist um, called Dr. Robert Gentry. I don't know if you've heard How of him. How did we get to furthermore? Um, because if I can understand your point of view from saying that, because I did present in, the, in my question an opposite point of view, that, um, that the person can know it if whatever it is, I guess, based on it being videotaped or, as you said, DNA testing, so, so, uh, so I'm, conf I'm confused, so, though, because you presented some things, I responded to them, and then without acknowledging whether you agreed with my response or not, you just said furthermore and wanted to move on. Okay, I agree that, yes, with DNA testing, that, yes, the person can know that. Okay. But I agree from that point. I don't disagree. So that my not um, acknowledging maybe that I would have agreed with what you okay. said. So. That's fine. Okay. So that's what I said. Furthermore, I'm asking, have you heard of the scientist Dr. Robert Gentry? That name's not familiar. Okay, he's a theist scientist who, throughout the 70s and 80s, was able to look at the introduction of polonium halos and their uh, ability to, or their responsibility for the existence of granite. And he was able to look at their half life, which was about, I believe, three and a half minutes. Oh. And it was extremely short. And in his published publishings, it made um, scientists start to wonder if what he's saying um, is true, because for that to have such a short half-life is almost, as to say, you know, instantaneous, which goes along with creation. And the Bible which says that when God spoke, things came into existence immediately. And, um, you know, the, the, there has been very good evidence. He's gone through the different polonium halos. And many a times when he wrote to <coughs> other journals, I know if there's freedom of speech, you know, no one has to tell him that he can't write this or write that because they've, he's presented it and they've told him to revise it. And the only reason was is that they had problems with it because it seemed to be endorsing and actually proving creation to be true. So I'm saying that, you know, once again, you, May I? Yes. If, if, if there's freedom of speech, freedom of the press, he should have been allowed to publish that without them having to tell him to, to um, revise Stephen? it and put something different. Hey, Stefan? Yeah. When did, when did he come up with this? You said in the 70s? Around the, yeah, the late 70s so to the, the early 80s. Okay. So he wrote a book called Creation's Tiny Mystery. Okay. So that's um, 30, what am I, four, I'm having trouble doing the math in my head, 40 years ago? No, probably around 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 Okay, years 30 years ago. Yeah. And how much traction is that getting in the scientific community? Right. It, actually, he was, it's been published for quite a number of years. Yeah. And there has been um, a push by creationists to be able to, based on this evidence and um, other evidence from... No, but, you know, that's, but hold on, present. hold on. The, the point of, uh, what I'm asking is, you know, tell me about all the other scientists who are reviewing his work and finding out that he is correct and, uh, and that the scientific community is coming over to his way of thinking. Is that the case? Um, because there, that's there have been some based on the judges who have reviewed his work, and there have been some who've actually said that he has some credibility. Some, but like some is think. not some is not how it works in science, right? There's a lot of scientists out there, and you know, a guy comes up with a claim, anybody can 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 say anything. The question is, after 30 years, is this guy's claim making? You know, is it taking over? the uh, the you know scientific uh, worldview 
Is it? It's not taking over because the majority of the world um, doesn't believe in scientific evidence for creation. So you're also. so you're saying that that there's this guy who has got a claim. He made it 30 years ago, and the only reason it hasn't been accepted by the rest of the scientific community is because they are prejudiced. Yes. It's, okay. It's, Okay, well, if, if you actually go, for example, to Talk Origins, as I just did, because this was ringing a bell, not his name, but what you actually talked about, um, there's a, an extremely thorough debunking, um, it goes point by point to the fact that his model violates general, re, general relativity, um, his NRI model can, can reproduce observed features of the universe only by adjusting parameters in the model by hand. They list each of the actual flaws in these, and flaws for which evidently Gentry and his supporters don't have a response to. So I, I'm, I'm not an expert in, these, in this thing, and it, and it doesn't really matter um, to me that some, as Jeff was pointing out, that some scientist has come up with a theory, for example, that some other scientists happen to agree with. I'm only going to accept something when the preponderance of evidence says so. When, you're, when you claim that, that this is being refused because scientists have some conspiracy bias against something that would, that would disconfirm creation, um, first of all, I don't believe that that's remotely true. But second of all, um, I, I, the, reason, or the, the reason that I don't think it's remotely true is that his theory does not confirm biblical creation or any other creation. It is just a different model of the universe. You, it, there is nothing that says, if let's assume, for example, that his model was actually correct. You cannot draw a line from his model being correct to therefore what the Bible has to say about creation is necessarily correct and therefore there is a, a God. Finding something that is consistent with a biblical creation account does not prove that that's what actually happened. And in this case, his model is wrong. Yeah. Now, and, and one more thing, Stefan. I mean, you can say that the only reason that, uh, that, that the scientific community has not accepted this guy's views is because they're all part of a conspiracy to, uh, to not accept it. But you know what else you can say? You can say that the only reason that this guy and his supporters proposed the, their views in the first place is because they're part of a conspiracy to get their views accepted. What all you know? Either side can play that game. Let's not play that game. Let's look at the evidence, and that's what scientists do. That's their job: is to look at the evidence and see if it supports a theory or not. Right. Um, I mean, anthropology is a science as well, right? Uh, sure. And. And many in anthropology have discovered things that have supported the Bible in terms of... Are we off on yet another claim? We're still talking about what, okay, uh, we'll Jensen? The, entry. I'll, I'll the not, point I'll is, not, the point I'll is, not you, cannot, you, cannot make it, you cannot make your case by saying, I've got one lone scientist and a small group of believers who all say this one thing that isn't uh, accepted by the scientific community, therefore that's evidence that my beliefs are true. That just doesn't wash. Okay, I will not jump around for you, but okay. the fact that, you know, there are many, as I say, science, because, you know, Gentry is just, a, you know, one of the, the few that do support this claim. And, uh, you know, just as I was saying, as I asked you, if anthropology itself is a science, and in their digging, you know, those physical anthropologists who go out there and dig up and discover things that do support it, you Such know, as, you know, the, you have anthropologists who dig, you know, who make but, but, excavation but, digs. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Things that let's cut to the. Ch I'm sorry, Stefan, may I? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so let's cut to the chase. What have they discovered? Have, have they well, discovered anything that's evidence that any supernatural events ever occurred? Okay, there has been one, even fossils themselves of men who have been over the height suggested by evolutionists, because evolutionists have said that we have developed and grown up from a smaller form to being bigger than we are now, and there have been the, bones of a man that, who that, 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 tall. 
Wow. Uh, you know, there's individual variation even to people now. This is just assuming, without even looking at any of the references, this is just assuming that what you're saying is true. You know, there's height variations among modern day humans now. The fact that you could, even if what you're saying is true, the existence of a fossil that is larger or smaller than expected is not proof of anything supernatural. Does this, does this fossil have like attachment, attachments for wings or something? No, it's I mean, just What fully, are you claiming that it is? It's fully human. It's fully human, 12 feet tall. Did it have, it, okay, so you're saying it was, it was 12 feet tall, what? Yes. 12, 12 feet, feet tall? I think we'll have Matt. <laughs> Matt is going to do the research I think, on this. I think, you've, I think you've been getting your information from very unreliable sources. I recall pictures of guys excavating giant skeletons, um, and those pictures have been demonstrated to be fakes. Um, you know, I... Uh, what was I the one in England, the famous one in England that was a statue? Things like Ramesisicus and all those guys, haven't they proven to be fake too? And also the other... No, 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 no. Quote, unquote, missing links? No, no, no. First, okay, wow. Hang on. Let me backtrack a second. <laughs> First of all, your conspiracy theory well, thing people. falls falls apart the second you realize that there, that atheism and evolution are not tied together and that there are tons of Christians and other religionists who accept that evolution is a fact. Oh, yeah, and I have it, one more it, it is, comment on that. It is a fact. It is supported by evidence. And even one of the, the current head of the NIH, who is head of the former head of the Human Genome Project, has said that even if there were no fossils, the DNA evidence alone would be enough to confirm common ancestry. This is an evangelical Christian who I despise for all sorts of things, and yet he is unwilling to uh, buy into this nonsense that you're buying into because the science does not support it. And now you're talking about digging up bones of, of 12 foot tall. <laughs> what, what sort of conspiracy planet do we have to live on where the, the discovery by anthropologists of 12 foot humans. It was done by evolutionist anthropologists, mind you. What, Name them. What, what, what world, what kind of conspiracy world do we li have to live in where the discovery of 12 foot human remains that disprove evolution, and I'm not saying that that necessarily would, but you are, aren't front page news everywhere? What sort of world do we have to live in for that to be the case? Yeah, the world uh, gradually has to be better. Uh, physically in terms of the air that we breathe because the oxygen content has also gone down. So it does not, it cannot support um, bigger life forms because of the oxygen content. Um, because what I'm saying that this supports it, if you, if someone who believes in the Bible, where Genesis 6 says that there were giants in the earth. You, you that, missed, you missed something very important a minute ago. And that, that is when I said that you can find things that are consistent with the Genesis account, yet they do not confirm it. In much the same way that anthropologists a, a thousand years from now can dig up New York, but that doesn't confirm that there was a Spider-Man. So the fact that you might find bones of somebody doesn't mean that the biblical account of giants or Nephilim or anything else are accurate. And even if there were some grain of truth in there, none of that gets you back to the supernatural claims that, that uh, are behind it. This is not the way reason is done. This is not the way a rational evaluation of evidence is. You don't begin with this and see how much evidence you can find that, can, that is consistent with it. And, and, and speaking of which, that reminds me, this is something I've wanted to say since the beginning where you said, uh, you know, Christians have their evidence and atheists have their evidence. And Matt has rightly pointed out that um, that you know, atheism and uh, and evolution are those are two different things, and that there are believers that accept the scientific findings of evolution. But not only that, atheists don't need evidence. There is one group that needs that needs to meet the burden of proof, and that's those. There it is. <laughs> I disappeared for a second. I don't think that's the 12-foot one because that was and from like 40 and, feet. And that, that is the, the, the group that postulates, you know, that makes the initial claim. The initial claim is there's a God. 
Now, it doesn't matter what atheists say after that. It doesn't matter what evidence we do or do not come up with. The burden of proof is on the believers to show that their claim is true. And the reason we're atheists is not because we think we can prove that your God doesn't exist. It's because you folks haven't proved that he does. So all this stuff, I mean, wow, yeah, uh, you're, you, the, the things that you're bringing up are like crazy um, conspiracy theory, lunatic fringe, anti-evolution stuff. It that reminds you me. You really need to, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, you really need to, you know, check to see whether the sources you're getting this from are considered legitimate at all. Uh, other than by other believers like yourself who just desperately want this to be true. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me a little bit of like the Paluxy tracks, where somebody is convinced that they have found fossilized human and dinosaur tracks together, thereby, you know, right there in concrete, we have proof that man and dinosaur lived and walked at the same time. And those, those tracks are simply not what the believers claim they are. And no, because they are, instead of following where the evidence leads, they are leading the evidence to the conclusion that they want to accept. It doesn't matter how many times scientists point out to these guys that no, that's not actually true. They're just not going to believe it. And so it lives on, especially on creationist sites on the internet. The first thing is, as much as I hate recommending creationist sites, if you go to, um, I believe it's Answers in Genesis, that has a list of arguments that they think creationists should not use, um, they're at least trying to eliminate some of the dumber arguments, like about moon dust and, and other things like that. Um, I, I'd recommend that as a starting point. And then, when you're done reading that, go to Talk Origins and read the other arguments. There's an index of creationist claims there, and it's everything from what you were talking about here to, to the giants. The, the information is available. Um, I don't. I don't know for a second if it would convince you because, you know, you, you're you're of a mindset that that this evidence that confirms your beliefs is is credible, and the scientists won't accept it because they have some sort of agenda to push. And that's not only is it is it wrong when you consider the fact that there are many believers who accept evolution, but it's also wrong from the standpoint of how science actually works. If in fact there was scientific evidence for the biblical account. Every scientist would be all over that because, first of all, it's Nobel Prize material. You're going to be rich. You're going to have grants all over the place. You, that is a worldview-altering or worldview-confirming event. And to play it up as if um, there's some anti-creation science thing that has taken over the world and won't let the truth come out, it, it puts you in the tinfoil hat group. So, I mean, what, what is this, the... Um the center of evolution anyway. What do you mean? Uh, you know, the first thing I, I've heard of in evolution is the Big Bang Theory. That's and, not and, part of evolution. Big, the Big Bang has nothing to do with evolution. Evolution, evolu the theory of evolution by natural selection begins after life formed. It has nothing to do with universal origins, and it is only loosely tied to abiogenesis in the fact that we need some explanation for how life formed in the first place. Evolution deals with how creatures evolve over time. And I will admit to you that I have not even really scratched the surface of studying evolution. But, you know, I, that's why I'm asking what is the real center of it all? What does it wholly stand upon? Evidence? But, yeah, I mean, no, not just evidence, but what was the initial thing that started the study of evolution really and truly? The observation of the diversity of life and an attempt to come up with an explanation for it. And the evidence continued to point in the direction that small changes over vast periods of time can account for the diversity of, of, of life on the planet. Right. And, you know, the thing about it is, do, I mean, do you all guys believe in the Big Bang Theory? Well, that's, that's a weird phrasing, but I'll just say yes to save time. And have you witnessed it? No. So Obviously. Isn't that just accepting it without any... No. No. No, because the, the, you know, look, um, the evidence for a god, the evidence for god is like visions, you know, and dreams and 
claims of divine visitation and things like that. The evidence for the Big Bang is like, you know, carefully measured, uh, uh, carefully taken measurements of the natural forces in the real world. Yeah, it, it, so it, it, the, the kind of evidence that supports it is completely different. But but what you're asking, and this is why this is why I'm saying that you know you're you've fallen prey to creationist arguments. It's so typical. They're teaching little kids to go into their science classroom, and as soon as somebody starts talking about millions of years, the question they want them to ask is, "Were you there?" And that's exactly what you just did. And I, I'm going to as nicely as possible explain how absolutely asinine that is. You touched on it earlier in the, you only know who your, you weren't there. You have no evidence that your mother was there. And I said, yes, actually there is evidence. You can do DNA testing. And that is the confirmation. It doesn't matter if I was there. I didn't witness Jeffrey Dahmer kill a bunch of people, but that's the conclusion that the evidence leads to. So yes, I accept that in fact he did. I wasn't there when George Washington became the first president of the country, but the evidence leads me to conclude that that historical account is most probably accurate. And in the case of the Big Bang model, that is the result of a lot of math and thought that said, what, it, what is the explanation for the origins of the universe? And it's not like once we got the math somewhere we liked it, we just stuck with it. No, it was a, it was a model that made testable predictions. And then we went out and we did things like building the Hubble telescope and other instruments that allowed us to measure the microwave background radiation and confirm that the model was in fact accurate. I didn't have to be there to have sufficient evidence to believe that it is the best scientific explanation of origins. And what I find particularly amusing is that the creationists who want to ask, were you there? Um, most often they are particularly evangelical Christians. Were you there when Jesus was resurrected? I wasn't there, but... Uh, what, evidence then, what evidence then do you have to believe that it actually happened? And this is where Christi um, the theism is different from... I guess, yes, and say, yeah, it is, because you don't have evidence. Where it is accepted by faith, but there are physical examples where you said, you said that they're none, but that's not true. You do, the, the difference between, between theism and, these, and science is that for things that we weren't present for, science relies on evidence to lead us to the best possible conclusions about what happened. And religion relies on something other than evidence. Why? Because they don't have evidence. Faith is the excuse people give when they have no good reason for their beliefs. But if you right. had a good reason, you wouldn't need faith. Right, but you said, you said, right, that there's no physical evidence for creation, but that's not even true. Yes, it is. Uh, or you're, you now have, you have the floor. Tell us what the evidence for creation is. There are many of them, as I stated earlier, from excavation digs. There's also, also the account of the ark. There's also Mount Sinai, which, which is so Which black. account of which the ark? Account, I mean, they've found the ark 40 times now, and none of them have actually found the ark. And by the way, finding an old the boat... the ark of the covenant, and, which and, is in, in Israel's, um, in Israel's yeah. economy wow. in terms of the sanctuary and all that. Wow. They found yeah, it you, in Indiana Jones, the first movie, too. <laughs> this is not... I'm not even about the Indiana Jones. This is from studying it. Myself. Yeah, no. <laughs> and there's you really, really need Mount, to check. To, you Mount really Sinai need to double check the. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Wait, go ahead. What, Mount Sinai, what? Mount, there's Mount Sinai, which the Bible says became smoke when God came into contact with it. Okay, so, so what? How so, does that. How, what does the existence of Mount Sinai have to do with the truth of the Genesis and account of creation? Well, I'm, no, what I'm saying is you said that there's no biblical account. Or any, sorry, there's no physical ex uh, examples for creationism, but there. But what does there Mount is, Sinai have to do with creationism? No, I'm saying that the state of condition of Mount Sinai now is, relates to what happened when God came down upon Mount, Mount Sinai. Okay, first of all, first of all, first of all, that is asinine, but what does it have to do with creationism? What I'm trying to say is that if Mount Sinai is in this condition that it is now, based on what was said in the Bible, then it proves it to be true. No. Wow. Okay. How did you demonstrate that Mount Sinai is in a, in, in a state that is necessarily the result of God coming down to it? How did you prove that scientifically? Be okay. One, there, has, there have been uh, shows done upon it, 
The show's done. <laughs> oh, okay, documentaries. Documentaries, yeah. wow. I know for a fact, at least one of the documentaries, just getting back to the Ark, at least one of the documentaries uh, about the, the discovery of Noah's Ark showed a piece of wood that was fabricated by a skeptic who was approached by filmmakers uh, to, to make this thing. And what he did is he took a piece of railroad tie and various household ingredients, including teriyaki sauce, and he soaked this piece of wood in those things and then handed it over to the filmmakers who were just not interested in where he got it or how he made it look like that. They were only interested that it looked good, and then they put it in their show and said, this is a piece of... The of uh, of Noah's Ark. But, I mean, but yeah, I'm Noah's more, Ark. I'm more and that and that skeptic got an award from a skeptical organization for pulling off that stunt. But ignoring the Ark, I'm in, I'm interested in this thing. You're, you're saying that Mount Sinai is currently in a condition <laughs> that can only be explained by God actually coming down to Mount Sinai, and you think that this is scientific? Because listen, no, no, no. When things, when things are burnt, they're left in a charred state. Okay, that but burning does Mount not Atlantic. prove God came down. Because that is, how can you explain a mountain top that big? There we go. Like that? There we go. Now we are to the core reason that you have bought into every moronic claim that you've presented today. And the answer is one great big argument from ignorance. The mountain is in this state. How else can you explain it other than that God came down? That's a logical fallacy. It, it demonstrates that you have no basis for saying this. It is in no way scientific. You are basically saying the mountains here, um, it looks like once upon a time it was smoky. That's consistent with the Genesis account. Nobody's got a better explanation. Therefore, that's what I'm going to believe. I can't begin to explain just how unscientific and dangerous that is. That is how we have come up with every wrongheaded, moronic, asinine belief that we've ever had. Oh, right. lightning bolts. They must, I don't, can't think of a better explanation. This guy down the street says they must come from Zeus. Therefore, I'm going to believe that they come from Zeus. And it's, you know, ooh, we did some investigation and we found out that we can direct them with, you know, little rods. If we stand there and chant to Zeus, he'll strike us with lightning. I mean, it's, it's that type of thing. You are saying Mount Sinai looks like it got burnt and therefore the biblical account is true. That is not following the evidence that is leading the evidence. And when you follow that up with, can you come up with a better explanation? You have just committed one of the most painfully obvious logical fallacies of all time. It's an argument from ignorance that because somebody doesn't have another explanation, therefore yours is viable. And I'm sorry, it's just not the way reality works. Yeah. You still have to prove that the God actually came down and did that burning. So even if it's from a biblical account, that's not good enough, right? Correct. Correct. And, and, okay. and you already know this, because do you accept the accounts of what happens in other uh, religious books? Do you accept, you know, claims about the Prophet Muhammad? Do you accept, you know, the, the birth of Buddha? Do you accept any of those claims, the miracle claims from other competing religions around the world? You, they have no, no, no better or worse evidence than what you have for yours. I mean, if, if that's what you want to believe, because we've gone into it, age. It's not. It's not no, hold okay. on. Dude, no, you age. hold on. <laughs> this is not about what you want to believe. What you want to believe, as I've been trying to explain, is completely irrelevant. What I'd like to believe is true is completely irrelevant to what's actually true. And the difference between you and us is that we care whether our beliefs are true, and you care whether or not what you believe is what you want to believe. Okay, here's, here's the thing. We really should move on. Yeah, we're going to move on after this, so get your last shot. Okay, in. all right. My, my last point about it is, is that, you know, early on you said in the show that it's not right to um, violate someone for their rights. And, you know, I realized today that evolution has its sway. I'm in college right now. And evolution has its sway in basically almost every science there is. And, you know, it seems unfair that creation can find, ha, had such a hard time finding its way. Creationism has wow. such a hard time yeah. finding yeah, but its way. You know, astronomy is in all those schools, too. Is it unfair that astrology doesn't have its way, way finding its way into the classroom? Is that unfair? 
Is it unfair that we have a bias toward truth? Is it unfair that we have a bias toward things that are scientifically demonstrable? Is it unfair that we discriminate against batshit crazy ideas and, that, that are, happen to be popular with somebody? And, and Stefan, thanks very much for perverting the intent of something I said earlier in the show. I did talk about how uh, you know, a, a group that has internal behavioral rules should not expect that it has a right to impose those on people outside its group. But I was not talking about what they teach in college. You have a right. It, it, to, to, in order to properly apply what I said, you need to know what your rights actually are. You have a right to your beliefs. You have a right to your own beliefs. You do not have a right to your own facts. The facts are whatever it is can actually be verified in the real world. Okay, That's so what the facts I mean are. If you're finding evolution at every turn in college, it's because that's what the facts support. You have a right not to believe it, but you don't have a right to claim that just because something is written in your religion's holy book, that that is magically a fact. Okay, so, I mean, as I said earlier, gentry is just a small number. Yeah, one. Of scientists uh, who has supported it with his scientific evidence. And if they're, you know, Throughout time, we do have other scientists who will keep studying and coming up with other things. And therefore, if they can present this, yes, the day uh, the day that know, the day that they present sufficient evidence for their claims, that's the day that they get taught in schools. That's the day that they are then justified in 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 you would be justified in believing them. Right. If you believe them before then. You're just guessing. Right. Well, that was a long call. Yeah. Uh, and there's now, now all the lines are full and everybody's on hold, so let's see what we can get through. Uh, Dan in San Jose, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks for waiting. How you doing? Uh, pretty good. Uh, I, I'm an atheist, and I've uh, been a longtime fan of the show. Um, I do have a big bone to pick, though, with, uh, with not specifically you guys, uh, but atheists in general, the atheist community. Uh, I see there's a big problem in our uh, approach to this whole uh, discussion of theism and religion and whatnot. And uh, so after I do have, I would like to explain what my complaint is, and then I would like to propose a solution to it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, first is that uh, logic is, of course, a human conception. It's what we try to use to understand the world around us, and it's a predictive sort of construct that we like to, to pose to uh, address reality and the way things should be and the way, the way they shouldn't be, how we, you know, debunk someone's argument and whatnot. But the, the problem that both atheists and theists uh, often have is that they fail to realize that this is all based on our perception, uh, that they, they tend to believe their perception of the world is based on their logic rather than the other way around. So it's, it's fine and well to, to point out uh, logical contradictions in someone's arguments, but if you aren't going to ever address the percep perception that leads them to that sense of logic, I don't think we're going to get very far. Logic is not predicated merely on our perceptions. The, foundational, well, the foundations of logic, the absolutes, are true irrespective of any mind or presence or uh, ability to perceive them. That's how we identify fallacies with respect to validity. Fallacies with respect to soundness address the truth or falseness of the premises, and that is, of course, a matter of, uh, you know, our ability to assess evidence from perception. But, I mean, it, you're, you're kind of making it sound like um, uh, that it's kind of all up to how people want to look at the world, and that's simply not true. Well, I don't mean to, to put it in that, that uh, respect. I'm, I'm just trying to point out that when we, when we uh, produce a, um, a theory or, or a sort of explanation for the way things should be, it's uh, typically based on our observations and the things that we can use to uh, empirically uh, examine the world around us and, you know, uh, the, the general th things that kind of go along with that. Uh, but the thing I, I tend to find lacking is, is just that people don't tend to uh, acknowledge that this whole discussion is based on uh, the things that we, we use to examine the world around us. And so, I, I mean, I just I find that if, if you're going to – if uh, uh, basically, I find that atheists spend a lot of their time pointing out contradictions in theistic arguments, but they don't ten tend to spend any time trying to figure out why they contradict themselves. 
that, I mean, t telling a Christian that there's a contradiction in their belief system is like telling an alcoholic that they have a beer in their hand. No, I mean, it's you not. Just... You, think most, you think most Christians, for example, know that they ha have logically flawed arguments and that, and that they're just no. going to believe anyway? No, I'm saying... Then, I'm saying... Mo then it's not like that. No, right, right. Because most alcoholics that... would know that they have a beer in their hand, wouldn't you say? Well, I would say that some of them are in too deep to, to understand what you're even telling them. So half the time they don't, they don't understand what you're saying, and the other half of the time they don't care. Uh, um, I, I, if I, I'm going to try to find something that I agree with in what you've been saying, okay? Um, if what you are saying is that uh, these discussions that atheists have with theists should include more of an explanation of where the theist is getting his ideas from in the first place? Yes. Then, sure. I mean, I think we, it, our last discussion, though, that went on for like, you know, 45 minutes, uh, got deeply into that territory. So maybe that's an, an example of, um, of the kind of thing you think we should be doing more of. Uh, no, I, th I think that there's uh, an inherent paradox in the notion that an omnipotent being can be uh, can demonstrate omnipotence and intelligence at the same time. Okay, so what you were saying that we need to be talking about? Um, yeah, what does that have to do with? Yeah, the other thing? that has nothing to do with what you were just saying. You were saying that we should be exploring where the theists are getting their 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 core ideas from, getting their what uh, what perceptions they're having that leads them to the conclusions that they reach, as well as looking at the logic. I mean, I mean, and curiously, we did that. So now what? Cur curiously to me is that you seem to be presenting a logical paradox as what you think we need to be addressing after talking about not addressing the. the I, I, you lost me. Well, it's it's a. Well, for, for instance, uh, I've watched uh, several of your last episodes, and a lot of them were based on the topic of design. Uh, there's the uh, people perceive the, uh, the, uh, the or people believe that they perceive the creation and the design of the universe, and yada yada, and they're repeating their statements rather than having any uh, substantive explanation for where they're getting their arguments from. And you you ask them wh how they make the leap from saying that something appears to be designed to saying that it is designed. Correct. So, and so the the problem that I see is that uh, that people, that they the theists end up contradicting themselves because because they don't uh, realize that the uh, the notion that they can perceive this uh, this um, design is itself a perceptual paradox. That uh, where I'm, where I'm basically getting with this is that intelligence as a word you know comes from the uh, the the uh, root words of uh, enter and ligure, meaning to choose between. It, it's a functional description of how we are able to accomplish things despite being not uh, not omnipotent. That the, in, for instance, when we, my, my basic uh, explanation is that we base intelligence on an obstacle goal relationship uh, that operates at the, typically the, the subconscious level. So that when we, uh, for, which is why we intuitively put mice in mazes because Without limiting a mouse or you know providing a test, you can't see how much understanding they actually have. So you have to limit them to perceive their intelligence. So if, to perceive intelligence, something has to be limited. But they're arguing that God is not limited. So and essentially, okay, in saying that Dan, you can perceive. Dan, I, I, I boy, I, I hate to be rude. Couldn't possibly care less or agree less. Um, and to, 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 to define intelligence as saying it's a choice between things because we're not omnipotent and therefore saying that it has a contradiction with omnipotence um, is kind of, you know, maybe there is a semantic paradox between intelligence and omnipotence. I don't know, um, but I also don't care, and I know that the only way to demonstrate it is to actually construct a logical syllogism and point out the fallacy there. So I don't know what the hell this has to do with what you first started talking about, nor does, do, no, do I know what it has to do with anything else because I'm an atheist. I don't hold any theistic beliefs, and not all theists ascribe to this idea of omnipotence that you're talking about. So you're, you're, you're focused on one very little narrow thing and not being really clear about what your objection or improvement is. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see that. Um, 
trying to explain because the I'm not saying that it's not possible for something to be intelligent and omnipotent at the same time. I'm saying that it's not possible for someone to perceive as much. Uh, so what I'm saying is that the... I, I, wow. Could I, could, I, could I just cut in? I, I really think, Dan, what you ought to do is write this up yeah. as in the form of a logical argument. And or send even just that, an extended email. Or, right. Yeah. Well, not too extended. Uh, uh, and send that in to, what is the email address? TV at atheist-community.org. Okay. And we'll take a look at it. Well, but this is, this have, is just going have, round and round and not, uh, not coming out anywhere, and, and, and we while, have to proceed with the show. And while I don't give a damn what the chat room has to say, I'm sure they're going nuts at this point. Okay, well, uh, I do have a uh, YouTube video series that I just completed. I'm, I'm sure so you did. Be... I'm sure you do, but I'm not going to let you pimp it until after I read your email and understand what I, you're talking about. I understand. So, I'll, I'll send that in. Thanks, Dan. All right, thanks. We got Stephen in Austin. Hey, we got a local call. Stephen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, thanks for waiting. How you doing? Good. How you guys doing? Pretty good. Good. Uh, I just well, wanted to kind of get you guys' opinion on this whole ancient aliens theory. You know, we've uh, we've seen now that you know there's evidence of atomic blasts in. Whoa. There is. Yes, there has been. Okay, such like, as. For instance. You're talking about ancient atomic blasts, right? Yeah, ancient atomic blasts. Yeah. Okay. Such how as? how ancient? Uh, three thousand to fifteen hundred BC. That would be before World War II. Okay. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> okay. Uh, such as the incidents in the Indus Valley, um, described in the Mahabharata at Mahenjo-daro. Okay, a description is not evidence. I right. can, so I can read you descriptions of a Balrog from Lord of the Rings. It doesn't mean there ever was one. What's the evidence that there was an atomic blast? They have proved vitrification of the rocks found in the Mohenjo-Daro site. They have found... Whoa. Uh, what, is, what does that mean, crude vitrification? What does that mean? Uh, vitrification is Vitrifies. when you take a, a rock and you've superheated it. Uh, uh -huh. And the only way to get that level of heat into a rock like that would have to be do some sort of nuclear transfusion. That's not true. I'd recommend you go get Phil Plate's book, um, his, his latest book about um, how the world will end. I forget the name of it. Uh, does anybody remember that off the top of your head? Death from the, Death from the Skies. Um, one of the things he does, he goes through all the different ways that you know the world will likely end. But one of the things that we know, for example, with like the KT event and others, there are these huge uh, you know, uh, impacts from meteorites, et cetera, that have the energy in the atmosphere of hundreds of thousands of nuclear weapons. So to say that a nuclear weapon is the only way that that type of heat could have been generated on Earth at any time in the prehistoric world is simply not true, since we already know of at least one event that generated more heat than that and, and potentially wiped out the dinosaurs. So we need something else for there to, to, to get from there was intense heat to, therefore, it was nuclear weapons, and then a step further to aliens. So where's, where, how do you bridge those gaps? Well, uh, talk about radioactivity, which doesn't come from asteroid collisions. Not you, true. I mean, and, and not only that, but it's, you, you've got uh, solar flare activity that produces devastating radioactivity, which could have happened countless times over the history of the planet. I, you know, you need more to get to nuclear weapon. Okay, I, think, well, <laughs> I think an answer to your question, Stephen, is we don't buy it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I know you guys are, are big on saying that, you know, the documentation through ancient texts are, are not a, a valid source, which I understand where you're coming from. Um, For some things. Well, they, they talk about how people's hair and nails fall out, pottery broke without any apparent cause, birds turn white. You know, there are certain things that people in that time could not have known that that is the nuclear expo you know uh, fallout that they you know they so, had no idea so no so maybe it wasn't nuclear so effect. maybe it wasn't you mean uh, uh, sure they couldn't have known that and i agree they couldn't have known that because i don't think they experienced any nuclear explosions that they reported they those other they, things they say that a single if, projectile charged with all the power in the universe an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as a 10,000 suns and? and swirling suns going around it. I mean, that's and well, they are. I mean, uh, all yeah, the take any human being. Let us nuclear explosion. Take any hu human being. No, dude. 
take any human being, let their imagination run wild, and write some shit down. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I mean... Well, it's not like it's just some, you know, off-random person writing it down on a piece of paper, and this is the Mahabharata that it's been around for thousands of years. So what? I'm sure there's somebody's laundry list that's been around for thousands of years. I mean, saying something happened and then getting to, to determine what actually happened are two different things. And, and what you're doing is saying, okay, we've got heated rock and reports of something that sounds like the after effects of a nuclear blast, and then saying that Sear seems reasonable that there was. When we already know that there are alternate explanations for many of these, including reports of uh, nova stars, supernova stars, which would produce, you know, intense light, uh, um, phew, uh, coronal mass ejections from the sun, solar flares, things like that. Any of those things could account for any of those, and you're putting them together in, 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 at different times in, in different ways. Um, at the end of the day, how much sense does it make that thousands of years ago, these ancient people who did not understand what was happening were being, I don't know, bombarded by alien nukes? I mean, really? Yeah, what was the motive? What was, yeah, why, why would, that, would that happen? I mean, it doesn't pass the sniff test. Aliens came all the way across the galaxy, um, found Earth with a bunch of kind of like primitive cultures that were Where, able to make the theory, pottery. The theory doesn't say they came across us and just found us. The theory actually goes that, you know, they took life here, here on Earth that was abundant in its many different varieties, gene spliced the actual, even maybe the apes, uh, to sub create this uh, yeah we, we're really not buying it now and, and and in addition to this they blew up some nuclear weapons while they were doing piling, this gene splicing piling more crazy claims on top of it does not make it more believable yeah that's a fundamental error well you can say that it's a crazy claim and you can tell me that it's not viable all you want but what if just put yourself in my shoes what if it is true what if monkeys well, fly how, out of my back how bad would that shake your foundation it doesn't matter a, a claim is not more likely to be true, you know, by, is not made more likely to be true by making it more extreme. It wouldn't shake what my foundation. What matters is what's actually true. It doesn't matter how big a deal it would be if it was true. That's irrelevant. It wouldn't shake my foundations at all because my foundations are on evidence. And if you prove that it was true based on evidence, it doesn't shake my foundations. It gives me a broader understanding of what is actually true. There's, there's been the evidence, but what about the no. ancient, what about the Nazca <laughs> no, lines in Peru? The Nazca lines of Peru. Okay. Um, wow. You're done, Stephen. Sorry. I mean, I can't, I can't possibly waste an entire show with two calls about the most batshit crazy, you know, ideas. And you don't see the evidence even in our daily lives? Increased of what? Volcanic activity, global warming temperatures going up. Evidence, uh, evidence our daily lives of what? Aliens? The is planet this? Nibiru and Nephilim coming our way. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> Please tell me you just called to mess with us. I'm, I'm really, I, honestly, you know, I don't buy into any of it either. I well, then why get, did you bring, why did you do <laughs> I that? I to get your guys' opinion when unbiased. I see. I think we had that in the first, like, two it, minutes, dude. All right, look, look you think it's a lot of crap. You, you heard a bunch of stuff that you don't really buy into, so you called to see if we bought into. You knew before you called that we weren't going to buy into this because you already realized there's not sufficient evidence, so you just kind of wasted a bunch of time. I mean, I don't need fake amusing calls. We can get amusing calls from real people. There are we can actually be amusing wearers. ourselves if we yeah. put our minds to it. We got, uh, is it Shilpa in Phoenix? Hey, Matt. Hey, we, Jeff. Yeah, we called, talked last Hi, week Shilpa. after the show. I know. And uh, hey, by the way, Jeff, I did call once and uh, say thank you to you about the hell, um, you know, that you were giving people about hell. <laughs> He's giving them hell about hell. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. That's really cool. Um, thank you. Yeah, because uh, uh, that helped me a lot with, you know, um, dealing with that. But anyway, um, Matt, we had that long argument last time about like after show. and. Yeah, did you uh, determine you I was right? You said, um, oh, you said a bunch of things. You called me immoral. You said I was a liar. Uh-oh. No. I, you're misrepresenting what happened afterwards. I said in those particular situations, that would have been my response. I don't no, know, man. It's know, your word against I, hers. 
I was just saying, you know, kindness is better than truth, but obviously you don't believe no, that. No, you're right. I do not believe that kindness is necessarily better than truth. I do oh. not. I do not believe that. I, that doesn't make me opposed to kindness. Well, I know. A anyway, but, so what would you have for today? Well, I just wanted to ask you then, you know, um, based on the things that you said, what um, what do you really think uh, should happen to religion? As you, as an atheist, what do you what do you feel that you want to see happen to religion? You can go. But me, she asked yeah. you. I, well, I know. But. Uh, I um, I would like to see all religions looked at the way we look at the one, the dead ones now. Mm -hmm. You know that. I think Norse mythology is cool. I think mm -hmm. ancient Egyptian mythology is cool. I think Greek and Roman mythology is cool. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by reading books about these crazy characters and their wild adventures and their amazing superpowers. I think that's fine, mm -hmm. right? Right. But, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, I've, always, I've always said, there's nothing wrong with religion mm -hmm. that wouldn't be equally wrong if somebody came out of watching The Terminator Mm -hmm. And start saying to themselves, "Boy, I wonder if there's if there's uh, you know evil robots from the future going to come after me." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fiction is fiction. It's a fine thing to look at and study, and uh, and and that's great as long as nobody's taking it seriously. Yeah, it'd mm -hmm. be really cool if in a couple thousand years. Well, I realize some and to some extent it's already happening now, but people just went back to like the Christian mythology and created games to play with those characters. Although we, we already have that. that, yeah, we ha we have that now. But I mean, where mm -hmm. where that was the only real use for it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, people have a right to believe whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, and and the question, as it was written, was if it doesn't hinder progress, that's where we get into the sticky, mm -hmm. because I see all false beliefs as hindrances to progress, mm -hmm. just not all to the same extent. Right. Um, you can believe something and be wrong about it. Um, but and and it will hinder progress. It just they're not all going to to have the same effect. And so I think that there are in right now, if you made a list of the world's religions, mm -hmm. um, I could I, I couldn't rank them all in appropriate order, but I could definitely divide them up into categories as to which I think are most harmful to society on the whole, which I think are most harmful to individuals, which I think are you know the the least harmful to mm -hmm. to any category, progress, you know, yeah. societal health, whatever. Um, I'd like to see them all go away, but I want them to go away for, for good reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what I find, like, with religion is when religion, um, uh, religious myths can be seen as myths and as fiction by religious people, and they use religion in terms of a social or cultural context um, due to tradition, because there are many societies around the world that are very traditional. But if they can see their myths for uh, being myths, um, and they don't hinder science. They don't come into the area of politics. They don't come into the area of progress because they realize these are things that, uh, so it is a sort of dualistic mentality that they would have to have, but what would be so wrong with that, you know? What would be so wrong with it is that they are believing something is true when there's no good reason to think there's true. But, oh, and she, she said that they're, they recognize that they're myths. Yeah. But she they called them religious they're... people. I, 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 if, if I'm assuming that you know, there are Christians who, under, who, who believe that the Genesis account is a myth, yes. but they still believe that there is a God and, and other things like that mm -hmm. behind it. Now, and they don't necessarily let it affect their daily lives or, you know, scientific progress. If you're talking about people like that, then yes, they're less harmful than the alternative, mm -hmm. but they are still harmful to progress mm -hmm. because they believe something that is not demonstrably true. It doesn't matter if they recognize that there's a myth here. The problem is that they're looking at that myth and thinking that they're going to get some uh, important knowledge or information out of it. No. That there is some, some being somewhere <laughs> that has a message to convey to them. Now, if they've completely removed all, I mean, I, I, I just. No, not, not uh, what, what you're saying is that they would get some benefit out of it. But, um, no, you said something else, but I think they can get some spiritual benefit out of it, meaning it makes them quieter or calmer to what, subscribe what is spiritual? some of the, it makes them quieter or calmer people um, to subscribe to something that allows them to, um, basically, like, it's sort of an escape, like going to a movie, like you were saying, you know, the Terminator or, um, you know, any sort of heroism or, I don't, um, going to, I don't even know what you mean by spiritual, but well, like spiritual going to the movie, meaning, like, um, um, just being quiet or being calm. I don't mean like 
spiritual in the religious sense. I mean, you know, I hear yeah. spiritual yeah. used in other senses. I, obviously, you don't you don't like spiritual. At I all, hate so. the word. I despise <laughs> it with the fiery passion of a thousand suns. But Jeff wants to comment on it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's people like um, Joseph Campbell. Okay. Who uh, who's, who's he studies mythology, uh -huh. and uh, is a proponent of this idea that the inspiration that we can get from mythology right. is valuable in its own right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, and I think what I would say is there, there would be nothing wrong with people turning to myths for inspiration anything, any more than there's anything wrong with me turning to a Spider-Man comic book exactly. for inspiration. Exactly. But I wouldn't, if I turned to a Spider-Man comics for my inspiration, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call myself a Spider-Man worshiper. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that I'm a religious person in the Spider-Man cult. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm a regular old person that is looking at, you know, various things that I realize aren't actually true mm -hmm. and finding some inspiration in them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I can't think of an example in the real world mm -hmm. of anything I'd call a religion where its members are not people who actually believe that something underlying the myths ultimately is actually true, which is what Matt was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I, that's, I think that's, that's my response to your question is, wow, if that's all the people are using the mythology for, they're not religious. Mm -hmm. That's not religion. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for example, um, I've known... Um, some people who are Quakers, like the um, non-traditional liberal variety of Quakers, and many of them are atheists. Some of them call themselves Christians, but their main focus is like on values. It's not on um, not on any myth, but they do have this idea of a light. Like you know, there is um, some, the light could be inside of you, not necessarily outside, but it's something good that's in all of us. And you know, um, they. Um, concentrate on that. So I think that's like a beautiful sort of idea of spirituality, just something that makes you quieter and calmer and come together with other people. I, I just want to make one more comment. What do we need all these quiet, calm people for? <laughs> what, what is so great about yeah, being it, quiet and calm necessarily? It, it, well, sounds, it, like, it sounds like you're taking this ill-defined word spiritual and using it to promote, like and using it to, to promote you know, a, a pacified a <laughs> populace. Yeah, I think, I think quiet and qual calmness is a fine thing in mm -hmm. the right context. And I think mm -hmm. finding inspiration in things is fine. And I mm -hmm. think poetry is fine. Yeah. And, and, and finding some kind of poetic, right. you know, meaning or whatever. Those are all different. They, mm -hmm. all, they all already have labels. Mm -hmm. um, what, we what the hell does spiritual mean? Because you're saying you're, they get a spiritual <laughs> benefit. I still want to know. What does spiritual mean? What's well, spiritual benefit in sense? Um, it just helps you to, like, maybe um, develop your mind toward good values. Um, it's the same as, you know, what atheists tend to do. It's not any different from any human being. It's just... It's There's nothing I do that I would label spiritual, not only because I don't know what the hell the definition of the word is, okay. but because I have words for the things that I do. Yeah. What, what do you call them? For what? Uh, what do you call, you know, trying to develop your mind towards better values or compassion or... Reasoning, empathy. That's reasoning? Yeah, okay. I, reason is what guides in, in my morals, among other things. Mm -hmm. But so does empathy. Mm -hmm. well, okay. I, I'm still trying to figure out, people keep using this word spiritual. And I am, I am completely convinced that it is a nonsense word that they use to try to find some middle ground between being religious and non-religious. I think it is a misuse of language mm -hmm. to use this ill-defined term um, in the hopes that other people won't call you on it, and mm -hmm. I'll call you on it. I want to know what it means. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to the extent that you can use a word like that mm -hmm. as a catch-all for a whole bunch of different things you might find nice, right. you know, kindness <laughs> and calm and, uh, and insight, uh, wisdom and insight, yeah. those, those things, right? Yeah. I think as a catch-all term for lo those things, the, mm -hmm. the term spiritual, spiritual is inherently um, oversimplistic. I think yeah, those lazy. are all different things, yeah, it, it's, largely. It's, it's, They're it's very an extra, different things. 
It's an exercise in laziness. And, and I, think it's, I think it is dishonest because many but times... See, there you go again. I mean, that's, that's the same thing you said last you time. You bastard. I, I, I'm, being, I'm being honest. It is laziness to use the term, and but, I think it's dishonest. But that's dis your definition, Matt. I, that's your definition. What? That's your definition. No, it's not my definition. I'm giving you my opinion. Okay. It is lazy to use that term, and it is also dishonest because generally when people use that term, they're talking about how they're achieving some greater insight or whatever. And you know what the true key to developing greater insight is? It's to actually investigate, define terms, and understand them, not lump everything on together under one feel-good, ill-defined term. That, that is mud. That is not clarity. It is not simplification is the hallmark of intelligence. And when you have this muddied term that doesn't mean anything, it's lazy. It says, I really don't want to think about this too hard. I really don't want to investigate this too hard. I really don't want to dig into why I think what I think. I just want to kind of go and enjoy it. Well, that's fine. Everybody's entitled to do that. But don't pretend like you're getting some sort of enlightenment out of it and then put a label on it that people should could ooh and ah over. It drives me crazy. No, it, it's, not, it's not that sort of thing at all. I mean, spirituality is defined um, differently by different people. I mean... It's, it's a term that people use often, but I can see where you're going with it. I can see how you say that in general, people um, who think like this are also like this, or, you know, are lazy or, you know. Um, no, but no, that's I, not I, what he was saying. <laughs> He's saying it, look, it's, uh, earlier I was they pointing out, I was pointing out calmness is one thing, right? Wisdom is a different thing. Insight is another thing. Mm -hmm. Right? Those are all different things. And what mm -hmm. we're saying is that you're lumping them together under one term. Yeah, that's and you think what, you've accomplished something, and we're saying no. Talk about those individual things individually because they're different, and their differences matter. And you can talk about how they interact with each other as well. Mm -hmm. But that's Which not what you can't what do once you've labeled it all spirituality, and it's just this... It's just this amorphous blob of various things that you think are nice. Clarity but is dependent on definitions and distinctness and simplicity. That's, that's where clarity comes from. Clarity doesn't come from, ooh, this kind of all feels good, and I'm going to put this in it. I don't really understand it enough, so I'm going to call it spiritual. And that's where that word comes from. But you're also assuming a little bit that the, the people who call themselves spiritual or think of spirituality in that sense are not using reason. You're assuming that they're not. No, I'm not assuming that. I'm, I'm relaying this because every single time I ask somebody to find that term or talk about what they mean, they are unclear and unable to do so. It that is isn't a, clarity. That isn't insight. It is a nebulous term, yeah, but, you yeah. know. Um, well, I, I'm not assuming that anything about these people. I give them an opportunity. And it's and it, it's across the board. Go read. Go do an internet search for spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't find it, anything right. remotely yeah. appealing from yeah. anybody who's written on it. And even even Christians call themselves spiritual nowadays. So it's really yeah. I I agree with because you on it's that. in vogue. But I, I still have a little bit of difficulty with you um, not seeing that you know people should be able to look at myths and and you know. Uh, derive for themselves how they want to use those myths and I have no problem allow, with that allow themselves uh, a social or cultural context to practice No, that's fine. I have as no problem they, with that. As long as they don't make the mistake of thinking that any of it is actually true Yeah, I mean if, if that's, that's the case fine. then that's fine, right? That's I fine mean, except that your question <laughs> was your que you, you used the word religion to describe that and our only disagreement with you on that point uh -huh. is we don't think that's religion Okay it's religion when you've got those myths, you turn to them for inspiration, and you think somewhere down in there in, that, in, those, in those stories, mm -hmm. those stories are describing actual facts. Maybe it's spirituality. <laughs> it probably is, because uh, this is probably spirituality on some level. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, well, I don't know what else to tell you. It's nice, it's soft and cuddly. It's and relatively hey, we got like two you minutes left. Believe kindness is better than truth for sure, Matt, right? What's that? You still don't believe kindness is better than truth. I don't believe <laughs> that kindness no. is universally necessarily better than truth. I think there are situations where kindness is probably preferable to truth. Yes. But I am of the opinion that generally speaking, truth is better and preferable to kindness. I'm, I'm even willing to go on the line and say <laughs> under what circumstances uh, 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 kindness 
uh, takes over in, uh, is, more, is, is better than truth. Well, what I would... That, and that, uh, uh, if you don't mind, oh, go um, ahead. I think the only circumstances in which kindness is more important than truth mm -hmm. is when you're in a situation that's so extreme that it's too late for the truth to do any damn good. And, and the, the two aren't mutually exclusive. I'd say that truth is a kindness. It is. Telling somebody the truth is a kindness. Mm -hmm. And the only time that I would not tell somebody a truth is when it is demonstrable that lying to them is more kind. And, and, and by the way, that means looking at the big picture, not an immediate benefit, yeah. but a broad benefit. Um, I don't mind so much of the little lie about you know, Santa to a kid, um, although I kind of go back and forth on it on uh, you know, different things. But um, telling somebody a, a lie to make them feel good momentarily without considering the ramifications of that lie further down the, the road um, you've done them a gross disservice, and you've done yourself a gross disservice. And, and I don't mean and, you, and, Shilpa. I mean anybody. And the world, uh, you know, human yeah. culture uh, disservice. The better yeah. equipped everybody else is to deal with truth, mm. the better off we all are. If, if everybody was, had, had been instilled with the ability to handle reality without needing people to lie to them on occasion, if we had built up that society, right. then we wouldn't be having this discussion because right. truth I, would be I, the I, kindness. I agree with you on that, but I do want to tell Jeff, um, Jeff, I don't know if you heard that after show call where no. I called in <clears throat> and basically what I had said to Matt was um, that uh, I had met an old man who had lost his dog and I was, this is when I was a Christian and I was trying to tell him that Jesus loves him and he was like, no, um, but my dog will, will my dog be there in heaven though, you know, and I did lie to him and I told him yes, um, you know, and How I do you know that was a lie? Well, I mean, Did you know there was no heaven <laughs> at well, all? I, Matt called me a liar, so I'm just going along with what okay. he said. So, um, but I justified it, um, even as a Christian, I justified it as um, there were two scriptures in the Bible that said that the Spirit goes back to um, God who gave it, and that's in, I think, um, Proverbs. And there was another one by Paul that said, um, for now we know in part and prophesy in part, so we don't know everything anyway. So those were my two <laughs> justifications. She rationalized, so, so but so she didn't believe that it so was true, so and she said it, and that's why I said she was lying. Right. So the, the, fair, the fairest answer you could have given. And the, the, try you guys again, so. Okay. okay. All right, thank cool. you. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, I didn't say she was a liar all the time. I said if she, she didn't believe it was true. She told him, she said something that she oh, no. didn't believe was true. Oh, no, if you ever lie, you're a liar all the oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you call somebody who tells the truth? I don't know. When I meet him, Ray, I'll let you know. We got Joe and Austin. You get the last call, and you got like 10 seconds. I'm sorry. Quick comments. The State Board of Education has thinly veiled to re-indoctrinate the society. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, and on that note, I apologize, but we are completely out of time. Uh, it's, I, it's, to anybody who didn't get through, please email tv.atheist-community.org. As a reminder, when, after the show's over, we'll be going to Threadgill's 301 West Riverside Drive. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to join us there. Don't forget about the back crews coming up in September. There's the crew who make this show happen. And Thanks, who crew. Work on fi show yourselves. You have a camera. Woo, there Thanks, they are. Thanks, crew. You guys are awesome. We'll be back again next week. We appreciate everybody for calling in, and sorry for those we didn't get to. Bye-bye.